Hey there, I'm Joe Weems. Before we get into the video, I want to remind you about NGConf 2023 happening in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 14th and 15th. Head over to ngconf.org to check out the speakers, check out the talks, and to get your ticket before they all sell out. We'll see you there. So Sam, I used to work at an agency, and when I was there, I had this friend who asked for my advice. He was building an app and had to deal with a lot of endpoints from various places, receiving a lot of complex data. And then once he had that data, he had to combine all of it and then respond to it in some way. So I'm guessing you suggested he use RxJS. I did. But the thing is, he had a lot of trouble grokking RxJS. <laughs> And there's some evidence around that he's not the only person who shares this sentiment. So he was really struggling with the concepts behind reactive programming and streams. <laughs> I mean, so you may all be familiar with this classic article by Andre Stoltz where he talks about reactive programming being asynchronous streams. Maybe you've seen this uh, famous yoga dog image that was around the Angular community for years where we always use the phrase, everything is a stream. But what do we even mean by that? What do we mean by everything is a stream? I mean, is everything a stream, really? Well, let's think about this practically and take examples from data interactions that we deal with on like a daily basis as front-end developers. Are they streams? So let's say CRUD operations. If you're working with a database and you want to create, read, update, and delete items in that database using something like a REST API. Yeah, but I mean, those are like transactional things. You get one request, one response, and then it completes. It doesn't really keep streaming data at all. Okay, well, what about objects? So we have objects that have keys and values. Uh, are objects streams? Is an object a stream? Well, an object is a discrete piece of data. We could do something like map over the keys in an object, but it's not continuously outputting information, so it doesn't seem very streamlike to me. That's true. Okay, what about arrays? So arrays, we have sets of data items. Maybe they're the same type, maybe they're not. Are arrays streams? Well, arrays aren't inherently streams, but it is a set of data in sequence. So it makes logical sense that it's iterable. So it seems like that might be a good candidate to turn into a stream. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So maybe if we come back to this idea that everything is a stream, maybe a better way of thinking about it is that everything can be a stream. Okay, so under the premise of everything can be a stream, let's revisit the examples that we just talked about. Say REST API calls. We typically expect a single response, but we could think of this as a stream that only emits once. But what about calls to like a real-time API or a WebSocket? That is totally a stream. And then an object, like I mentioned, we could iterate over the properties of an object and stream those. And then we come to arrays again, and we can iterate over each item in an array over time, like emitting one item every half a second or something like that. Yeah, so arrays and objects aren't streams, but we can use RxJS to turn them into streams by adding the dimension of time for reading or manipulating the data. So let's look at how we can do that. So you might have heard of these things called creation methods. And creation methods like from can turn nearly anything into a stream. So Rx libraries are available for multiple different programming languages. And the Rx documentation site lives at reactivex.io. And this is the reactivex docs for the from creation method. These docs pretty clearly demonstrate the example of creating an observable by taking an array and then iterating over the items in the array over time and emitting them one by one. So like I said, the ReactiveX docs contain language-specific information. And since we're using Angular and JavaScript, we're going to look at RxJS. Now folks coming from traditional JavaScript backgrounds or trying to use promise-based libraries with their Angular apps might be tempted to default to an observable creation method like Frompromise, but unfortunately, in RxJS, Frompromise isn't exposed in the API anymore. Uh, Kim, I'm pretty sure that's from promise, just so you know. 
No, it's fraught for mice because you're making a compromise between promises and observables <laughs> by converting promises to observables. Now that makes sense. Okay, well even without fraught for mice, there are still several different ways to convert, uh, to create observables from other things. But it can be really hard to know which one to use and when. So the nice thing is we can rely on the documentation to know that and we're really fortunate that Rx is well documented. But the thing that happens to people is they go to the docs and they're overwhelmed. The docs can be a lot to take in. So if we take a step back, I want to come back to the root of the problem that we're trying to solve. Let's say that I know that I want to convert some existing data into a stream. So if I think of an observable like an array that's iterating over time, I can create an observable from that array using the from creation method. So then once I have a stream, how do I do anything useful with it? So for those, we use these things called operators. And operators are pure functions that take observables as input and then generate observables as output. So let's look at a few common examples. Okay, so if we're thinking about this like an array over time, maybe we can think about some of the operators the way that we think about JavaScript array methods, the ones we know and love and are really familiar with. So like map, for example. The map JavaScript array method documentation looks like this. You apply a function to every element in the array and then you return a new array that contains the transformed outputs. And we can do this to a stream too with an equivalent operator in RxJS. So the map operator applies a function to each item that's emitted by an observable. And this essentially does the same thing that the map method did to the array. Right, so similar to map, filter is another really common method uh, that we use with arrays. So let's see if there's an equivalent in RxJS. And it turns out, uh, so here we have the array method uh, definition for filter. It creates a new array with all the elements that pass the test that's implemented by this provided function. Uh, and it actually turns out there's a filter operator in RxJS that works basically the same way. So filter creates a new observable that emits only the items that pass the test in the function. In this example, only items greater than 10. The main important difference here between the operator in RxJS and the array method is that element of time that we've been talking about. So map and filter are really commonly used with arrays and so is concat. So what if I want to concatenate streams? This is the JavaScript concat array method and it concatenates multiple arrays and then returns a new one. So if we just look for the concat operator in Rx. And it's deprecated. So this Sorry. seems like something important we'd want to do, but we'll come back to it, I promise. Okay, so let's say I, let's pick math instead. If I want to use an operator, I would assume that the syntax would look similar to the way the JavaScript array methods look, right? Like uh, this. You, that's a natural assumption, but no, you have to pipe it, actually. <laughs> um, and so piping looks like this. So we have our array that we're turning into an observable, and then we can use the pipe method to pass in the map operator to change the data how we want and return a new observable. Okay, so what would be like a good metaphor for pipeable operators? I'm glad you asked. So let's say that you're building a roller coaster out of Legos. The first thing you'd need to do is gather all of the pieces together. Like a gather operator. Exactly. So then once you did that, you would want to assemble all the different pieces of the roller coaster. Like an assemble operator. Exactly. Uh, but then eventually you'd have your finished roller coaster model. Fun fact, this is real from Kim. Uh, so super cool, but the pieces themselves don't actually ever change, right? Like the Legos don't inherently change. And that's how pipeable operators work. Okay, so I think that helps to clarify how pipes work. But we talked about map and filter and I want to come back to concat because it was missing and I really want to be able to combine observables. Yeah, so the concat operator is deprecated but there is a static method for concat and that stitches the two observables together one after another without interleaving them and just emits each value. So that's great from like a really simplistic array-like use case. But we're talking about streams here. So what if we want to do something more reactive with the streams, like wait for one observable to emit first before we start on another one? Say we want to use continuous outputs. 
of real-time data to make another stream. If the concat mat static method doesn't do this, there must be something that does. Hmm, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at the operators again and search for concat. And we're trying to change something based on a value from another observable. So it seems reasonable that that would involve mapping. So let's pick concat map. And concat map projects each value to an observable and then merges it into an output observable one by one. Uh, the really important thing to know about concat map is that it waits for the data to be ready before moving on. So that sounds like what we want. Let's look a little closer at how this works. So here's an amazing animation of concat map made by Mike Ryan. Shout out to Mike. Hopefully you went to his workshop. Uh, imagine you have a bunch of packages on an assembly line. So those packages are going to process in order one at a time. They don't all process at once and they don't magically skip each other in line. Uh, and that's how concat map works basically. Okay, so seeing the animated diagram really helps me to kind of grasp what's happening in this marble diagram from the official documentation. The top line represents the outer observable, and then the next line is the inner observable. And each time the outer observable emits, we're going to map the values from the inner observable until that observable completes. Then we're going to move on to the next emission from the outer observable. But, like, what the heck is happening with this function? It seriously looks like that when someone was writing the docs, their cat just walked across the keyboard. It does. Uh, it turns out that's a notation for marble diagrams. It's kind of like a pseudocode for observables used in testing a lot. So those dashes are a text representation of the timeline of the observable. Oh, Kim, that reminds me, I found this awesome new combination operator in the docs the other day. Uh, it looks like this. Okay, so that looks useful, but as I'm looking at that diagram, I'm pretty sure it's a diagram of a football play. Oh yeah, that's true. So I can understand why you might have seen that and thought that it was a, whoops, <laughs> thought that it was a uh, marble diagram from RX, but there's another challenge for learners too, and that is terminology. So one operator that you may encounter a lot is called fork join, which is used with HTTP a lot when you would normally use things like promise.then or dot all. Um, but it can be really confusing. I mean, like, just look at this marble diagram. I have no idea what's happening here. Are you sure you got that from the docs? I just ask because it doesn't look like a football player. I'm pretty sure I got that from the docs. So what fork join does is it takes several observables and turns them into one that then emits when all of the observables complete. This one you can kind of interpret pretty literally from the name because it's like streams joining together at a fork or the tines and the handle of an actual dinner fork. So another one that people encounter that can be really confusing is exhaust map. You might see this a lot if you're using NGRX. Oh, I have a diagram of exhaust map and it looks like this. I think we can all relate to that one. Uh, so I've got another great Mike, patented Mike Ryan analogy for exhaust map. Imagine you are at a restaurant and a waiter comes and asks for your order and so you rattle off that you want a salad, a steak and a piece of cake. But then in the middle of your order you notice that the waiter has disappeared, come back from the kitchen with a salad and just says, okay, salad, what else? So as soon as you made your first request, he ignored everything else you said. So now you kind of understand how this weird restaurant works. So you repeat your order for the steak and he disappears and comes and brings you the steak. And then you repeat your order for the piece of cake and he disappears and goes and gets the piece of cake. And exhaust map works pretty similar to this. Requests that, are, uh, uh, that occur mid-flight of another request just get ignored altogether. Or to put it another way, other requests get ignored until that first request is exhausted. So a lot of these operators can behave and seem like special effects movie magic. When it's done right, you get this really great outcome, but something mysterious is often happening behind the scenes if you don't have that aha moment yet. So they're complicated until you have sort of that eureka where you pull back the curtains and then you understand how the magic happens. And I feel like understanding the naming derivation really does allow us to make more sense of the terminology because you have the additional context. 
And I saw this tweet a while back from Tracy Lee, and I was really interested to see what people would say in response to this, because I like to teach people RxJS. I had challenges learning it myself. And I think we can all relate to this response that basically <laughs> says that learning RxJS is literally the hardest part of learning RxJS. <laughs> so if you feel that learning RxJS is incredibly difficult and overwhelming, know that you're definitely not alone. We have for sure been there and are still there, uh, but we do have a few parting words of wisdom for you on your journey. Now because learning RxJS is difficult and it's been around for a while, we've been using it with Angular for quite a while, we know it's hard. And a lot of great resources have emerged, so take advantage of them. And if you know something, if you find something and have that aha moment, and you know that that could benefit others, share that content. Promote that content. Write a blog post, do a talk, share a tweet. And if you're teaching someone else RxJS, a lot of times analogies and metaphors can be really, really helpful when you're trying to explain difficult concepts. So Rx is hard and it can be overwhelming sometimes, especially getting started and trying to learn all of that complicated jargon. But don't feel bad if you don't get it right away. It's okay to try things and maybe the first time you string a bunch of operators together is not going to be the most efficient solution. But the important thing is that you're iterating as you learn. So everything can be a stream including your learning journey. And after learning all of the history and terminology, you'll finally feel this huge payoff when you built something really cool that works great. So my name is Kim Maida. I'm the VP of Developer Relations at Cloudinary. I'm also an artisan keycap maker. And I design and deal stickers. So if you <laughs> would like sticker free dealer. stickers, <laughs> come and see me in the hall outside after this talk. <laughs> And I'm Sam Julien. I am the Director of Developer Relations for Auth0 at Okta. I also wrote a book called Getting Started in Developer Relations. I love the outdoors and strategy games, and I am a scotch and llama enthusiast. So come find me at the Auth0 booth right over there, and uh, come talk to me about any of these things. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.